opening song will be Come Ye Sinner. Please stand.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have a uh, first reading of a transfer of membership. Brian Chen. I don't know if you remember Brian. Some of you might. Okay. He um, just uh, moved as a missionary. He called me after his graduation from university. I'm, I'm not sure where was he. He was at Andrews University, I think. Yeah. Or was it Southern? Okay, it was at Southern. He just finished his degree and he went off as a missionary to Thailand. So his home has always been here, <laughs> even though he was over the, there that long time. So this is first reading. So um, just a, a motion to, no, we don't do any voting, right? No, just a first reading. The second thing is that there's practical helps tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. And uh, we're going to meet in front of the school building. And we're going to go off and chop some wood and stack some wood for, I'm guessing, is it Joanne Warren? Yeah, OK, good. Just down the road here. Um, so if you would like to come and help out, that would be awesome, OK? Tomorrow morning, 10 AM. And uh, if you want to get some exercise and chopping some wood and uh, stacking wood, to help one of our neighbors down the road, that would be awesome. So um, come and meet in front of the school building tomorrow morning at what time? 10 a.m., okay. So if you can get your wallets ready, the offering today is going to reach BC and Yukon, which just happens to be my home. So if I could get the deacons to please come forward. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for another wonderful day that you provided for us and the breath of life and just the energy and I don't know, all the blessings that you have been bestowing upon us this week, especially with the week of prayer. And dear Lord, I ask that you would help to take these funds and get them to the right place and be able to use them for the furthering of your work, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Something that I'm really thankful for, for is that Ty has been a huge blessing for Week of Prayer. What are you thankful for, Pedro? I'm very thankful that the rain finally came down this week, and it was really nice to feel the, the smell and to see the, the dirt um, to be wet again, not need to do irrigation for the carrots anymore. And so now it's time for you to share. There will be roaming mics around, so please raise your hand high so we can see you and get to you. This is amazing. I got a call last night um, from my parents, and my mother got into a fairly large car accident, a head-on collision, and um, totaled both vehicles. Um, and they hit both on the driver's, hand, driver's side, and there was a young couple, or a li older couple, sorry, in the other vehicle. And um, I'm just very thankful that my mother is still alive. It was pretty close. Airbags went off, and the windshield smashed. and. The whole front of the car was in the back of the car, and it was a big mess. And so um, she walked away with minor injuries, and I'm just very thankful for that. 
Um, also yesterday, there was just a lot of things happening that I just like got reminded that God is still there working in my life, even though I may not see it all the time, you know. I'm really thankful for that. I'm really thank thankful for because last Wednesday um, I got my work permit so God provided there so I can stay at least here for a year and I hope it can be a blessing as all of you have been a blessing for me as well. I don't know if, um, I, I don't usually do this. I don't like to speak in front of people, but I, I, my heart is very involved right now in this. I'm sure you guys have heard about the hurricanes that are going on in, in the Caribbean. Um, it's hitting really close and personal for me. My sister has lost everything. I have aunts that I have lost everything. I have fam friends that have loved ones that have died um the whole island is without electricity it's it's total chaos right now in puerto rico and and dominican republic also is actually going through similar stuff i just read this morning that mexico had a second uh earthquake today this morning so it's just is a lot that is happening right now and sometimes i just want to say we we get into this environment here and we just don't realize how much pain and suffering is happening out there and um, that we really need to be um, just helping each other up and, and, and just keep everyone in the world in your mind. Let's pray about it because there's a lot of stuff that is happening out there, big stuff happening right now. Is there anyone else? I just, um, I just want to praise the Lord for his word, um, that we can depend on his word constantly. And I'm especially reminded of um, Isaiah 61, and I'm so grateful for his promise through Christ, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And um, I just praise the Lord that as as he shows us our need, um, that we'll have willing hearts that will be pliable in his hands so that he can truly set us free and we can help others. I'm just, hello, hello, hello. Oh, there you go. I'm just really thankful that um, next weekend, my brother's gonna come pick me up and he has been gone for a month um, in a Europe trip and I'm just really thankful I'm gonna get to see him. I just wanna um, really thank all of you who have been so friendly and um, gracious to us. We've been visiting here from Montana um, I'm very thankful that my nieces have been able to come and see such a wonderful school. Thank you. There's an old friend of the school uh, named JC that, <clears throat> that um, was befriended by a staff here at the school years and years ago. She, be she actually became an Adventist, handicapped lady living up in Fountain Valley. She now is down in Abbotsford area, and she is scheduled to have surgery, brain surgery on Thursday. She has a tumor, and she needs the surgery very badly, but it's hard to know if she's going to make it through it or not. So let's uplift her in prayer. Oh, 
let's kneel as we sing our prayer song. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings and your mercies on us. Thank you for another Sabbath that you've given us with life and health. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing week of prayer. And thank you, Lord, um, that you've protected us all throughout the time we've been alive. Lord, I want to thank you for Edison's mom. Thank you that you protect her in the car accident yesterday. And uh, Lord, thank you that you also gave Sydney an opportunity to work here. And Lord, we want to also raise up uh, our prayer requests. Please, Lord, um, stay with the Caribbean, with all the islands and people affected. You know that there's trouble. The end is coming, and we need your help more than ever. And Lord, just bless those people, give them comfort, and um, also stay with the, um, the sister that needs a surgery. Please um, bless her and give her your, your help, your comfort, and Lord, stay with all the prayer requests that I cannot remember. Please bless everyone that is in here today, and give them your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Children, you can come to the front. Okay, children, you can come to the front. Sabbath. How you guys doing? Good? Awesome. So I'm going to tell you about a time that some of me and Nick did this summer. So we were hiking with a family um, in Canada. And we just, it was a nice day. We hiked up to this ridge. And um, we were just looking out. And we looked down at this valley. And there was this um, lake. Uh, it was a glacial lake, and there was a glacier on the other side. Me and Nick were like, oh, it would be a really cool idea if we would go down and um, hike to that actual glacial lake instead of just overlooking it. And we should have just left it there, but we decided, oh, it would be fine. So me, uh, Mom and Dad and Josh, they didn't want to go, so they went back, and me and Nick started going down. So we hiked for about an hour. We made it down into the, the valley, and we just hiked up to the lake, and it was, it was beautiful, but it wasn't like, it wasn't that beautiful, and it wasn't really worth all that work to get down there, and then over on the other side of the lake, we saw this ice cave in the glacial, and it looked like it would be really cool to go see, so we thought, hmm, I wonder how we could get over there, so we started looking around, seeing different routes that we could take to get there, and... And then we're like, hmm, we should cross this river. 
And so it was this river flung on this lake, and it was freezing cold water. But we went across it, and we made it. And um, then we just kept on hiking along. Soon we realized that the side of the, the lake just started getting steeper and steeper. And soon it was just like lots of cliffs. So we hiked up to the top of them to try to get around. And it started to get really sketchy. There was like all the rocks were loose, and they would just fall down. We were like 100 feet above the lake, and it's just uh, no grip anywhere, nothing to hold on to, and we were getting a little bit scared, and then we saw this um, creek bed from this waterfall coming down along the bottom down to the lake, and it offered us some nice footholds. We were able to get all the way down the edge, and we just kept on hiking. It was so hard. There was like this uh, mud by the side of the lake, that's just like so slimy, you just sink right into it. And you'd have a hard time getting back out. And then there was these rocks that were like so um, steep, you couldn't get around them. So we tried to like get a rope and tie it to these other rocks, but they were so loose, the rope, there was nothing to tie it to that, was, that would hold. And we tried and tried, and eventually we were like, there's no way that we could get around this. It's just, it's too... There's too many cliffs, and we won't make it to the ice cave. <laughs> so then we had to hike all the way back, all the way over all that train, all the way back across the river. And you know what we realized? <laughs> it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it one bit. We didn't get to see that much cool stuff, and we wasted a lot of time and put in a lot of effort for something that wasn't that cool. <laughs> and so that is how it is in our lives a lot. <laughs> Our lives are kind of like ladders, and we have to choose what walls we want to leave the la lean the ladders up against. So we climb to the top of one ladder of our school, and we get to the top, and we're like, oh, what now? And so we keep climbing a different ladder. Say we want to climb a ladder of, like, getting a lot of money, becoming a rich businessman. So we climb that ladder, and then we realize that we're stuck. There's nowhere we could go. It's not worth it. And then what do we do? We have to rely on God every step of the way. Where do we want to go? If we spend all of our energy and all of our work getting rich or famous or becoming cool at something or whatever it is, then we just wasted our lives. If we spend all of our time and all of our energy on getting to know God, then that is, that is the hike that will reward us with such a great view, getting to know God. But if we do not do that, then we'll be like me and Nick or this summer, hiking all that time and getting nowhere. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for all that you've done for us and help us to put our time and energy and invest it in knowing you and draw us closer to you every day and help us to reach our goal, which is heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go. to be in your presence this morning. Father, you are great beyond our estimation. You are beautiful beyond our perceptions. Everything about you is wonderful. We ask this morning that we would get a glimpse of your glory that would draw us more deeply into relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everybody. Is it okay to move all this? Before we jump right into the message, um, I have a, a Sabbath greeting for you from Allie. She says, I love and miss you all to the moon and back. And then this is classic Allie. She sends another text right after that and says, well, the ones I know. So happy Sabbath to everybody. Are you all right? Is it a good day? It is a good day. I, I particularly enjoy um, our traditional Sabbath greeting. I love hearing the words, happy Sabbath. Just, it's like music to my ears, happy Sabbath. But I have to tell you that sometimes, quite honestly, uh, I think that we as human beings, because we're creatures of habit, I think sometimes we go into intellectual neutral on something that we become super familiar with. So if you hear something over and over again, uh, you have the potential to forget what it means. So when I say to you, happy Sabbath, and you say happy Sabbath to me, the question remains, did it register? Do we know what we're talking about? Or, or is it just some kind of greeting that we say by rote and we don't know what it means? So sometimes I like to change up my Sabbath greeting in order to infuse the greeting with meaning, okay? So here's my Sabbath greeting this morning. Happy salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ's day. And now I want you to try it on the person sitting next to you. Go ahead, it's your turn. It's a mouthful. And then, and then when you get real good at it, you can say it fast. Happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. Yeah, yeah. Because, because in fact, that's what the Sabbath means. That's what the Sabbath means. That's the significance of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a memorial of finished creation, right? Genesis chapter 2 and... and Exodus chapter 20, God gave us the Sabbath to remind us of the finished work of creation. But are you aware that there's a second version of the Ten Commandments that were given? There are two versions of the commandments. There's the Exodus 20 version. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, etc., etc. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. So it's a memorial of creation in Exodus 20. But do you remember in the story that Moses broke the commandments into pieces? Do you remember that part of the story? And then God gave a second set of tables of stone. And that version of the Ten Commandments is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And in that version, the only commandment that is different is the Sabbath commandment. All the other ones are exactly the same. But the Sabbath commandment now is keep the Sabbath and remember that I delivered you out of Egyptian bondage. Creation's not even mentioned. So the Sabbath is both a memorial of finished creation, but it's also a memorial of the finished work of redemption. Jesus saves us by his mighty power, not by by our effort or power. So happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. That's what the thing means. And all of that was stalling to make sure the, 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 the slides work. And are they working, guys? Are we good? Can we fly? All right. We've prayed, and I want to invite you um, to consider a message this morning that has been of extreme significance to me, and I hope it's a blessing to you as well. Now, in order to access this message, I need to remind you about a very common, a very common psychological phenomenon that occurs all the time, whether we recognize it or not. Every single one of us, we're governed by laws, and some of those laws that govern us, we're not always thinking about every moment of the day as those laws are in force. But the fact is that every single thing that we experience as human beings, everything we experience occurs against a backdrop of sensory stimuli. Am I right? So picture yourself, you're in your living room maybe or your dorm room or wherever it is that you hang out and you're sitting on maybe your favorite chair and you're reading a book. 
So you feel, although you're not conscious of it, you feel the fabric of the chair. You're not thinking about the feeling of the fabric of the chair, but you feel the fabric. You feel the book, right? Simultaneously, maybe there's beautiful music playing in the background. Maybe Beethoven's Third Symphony is playing softly as you're reading. You're not focused on the music, but it's an auditory sensory input that is taking place while you're reading the book, right? And simultaneously, maybe somebody is cooking um, chocolate chip cookies or carob chip cookies or whatever it is that you prefer in the kitchen. And the aroma, the aroma of those cookies coming out of the kitchen and you smell them as you're reading your book. Man, what a great day, huh? So many things going right. But you're not really focused on all of that sensory stimuli. What you see out of your peripheral vision as the birds are flying by the window, what you smell of the cookies, what you feel of the fabric of the chair, you're not focused on all of that, but you're sitting there reading and you're just living life and you develop some kind of mission. You have to do something. I don't know what you have to do. You get up and you begin navigating through your house. You're going somewhere. You hit down a hallway. You open a door. You enter into the room and say something to yourself like, what did I come here for? Have you ever experienced that? If you're above 40, you're experiencing that with increasing frequency. By the time you're 50, you will be forgetting things that you thought you could never forget. You will be looking for your glasses and they will be on your nose by the time you're 50. So you forget and you go in the room and you can't remember what you came there for. Now here's the law that I want to talk to you about. You enter into that room and you can't remember what you came there for. What do you do in order to recover the memory? What, somebody said it, retrace your steps, right? You just kind of freeze frame the moment. You don't want any other sensory stimuli to interrupt the memory processing. So you just kind of back up very slowly into the room you came from. You sit down on the chair. You pick up the book. You see the birds. You smell the cookies. You hear the music. And what are you hoping for? You're hoping for what cognitive scientists call a memory trigger, a memory trigger. You're hoping that the smell or the sight or the sound will what? Trigger the memory of what it was that you were going to do when you went to that room. And if that memory, and it probably will, studies have shown, for example, that if you study for a math test while listening to music in the background, if in the classroom that same music that you were listening to when you studied is playing, you will grade more highly. Because there will be in the music a constant reminding of what you were studying preparatory for the test. So you will probably remember what you were going to go in that room for. Don't you think? And when you remember it, what do you do? Well, you write it on a yellow post-it note and you carry it into the room with you, read it, and then execute whatever you were going to go there for, something like that. But I tell you all of that in order to tell you an experience that I had and an experience that Jesus had. Okay, first my experience. When I was a little boy, maybe seven, eight years old, I had the awesome privilege of being at my grandmother's house. Now, my grandmother was the classic grandma. She was a real grandma, not so like some of these young grandmas like you see now, these, these young, beautiful grandmas, Kathy. Not like those kind of grandmas. But my grandma was the real deal. My grandma was kind of tall. She was big framed. I mean, I was a little boy, so it might have been an illusion, but it seemed to me like she was just mammoth. Here was my grandmother. She was big, and I was a little boy. And my grandma, my grandma... There were so many incredible things about her. I loved her. She was amazing. She had long, 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 long gray hair like grandmas are supposed to have. And she twisted up that hair into a big pile on top of her head, and she put two, literally two sticks through her hair to hold it in place. This is my grandma. She made all of her own clothing on a treadle sewing machine. My grandma was awesome. She did not need electricity. And she made all of these dresses, the same dresses, from her neck all the way down to the floor, just, just before the floor. All of them were the same pattern, I'm telling you. Different materials, but the same exact dress. And she had a bunch of them hanging in the closet, and she would just work through them. 
My grandma was a real grandma. She had her teeth in a jar by the bed. <laughs> and she was so amazing. Sometimes you'd be going through the day as, as a grandkid and you'd be interacting with grandma and she would get down low and she would let her teeth drop from her gums and clank around in her mouth and watch the grandchildren scream in terror and run. <laughs> and then she would be laughing as we're running away, but we weren't really afraid. We were just going through the ritual because we so wanted to see this mystery of teeth that weren't actually connected. So this, this is my grandma. She had a loaded shotgun by the front door. And she said that was in case any Democrats came around. <laughs> As a little boy, I had no idea what that meant. I did not know what she was talking about. I was like, oh, okay. So Democrats are evil, I guess. That's what I thought as a little boy. She did not have a washing machine. She did not have a dryer. Um, my grandmother would put all the dirty clothing from all the grandkids into the bathtub, fill it with water and detergent, and we grandkids would take turns, shifts, marching back and forth on the clothing with our pant legs pulled up or wearing shorts, just marching, 10 minutes each, get out the next grandkid, and then the clothes would be all ringed out. She would hang them on what she called a line in the backyard, no dryer for my grandmother, a line in the backyard. I remember as a little boy going out into the backyard <laughs> and looking at all the clothing hanging on the line one day, and I saw my little boy undies hanging right there on the line, right next to my grandma's undies. And I was like, whoa, my grandma is big. And I knew she was not to be messed with. But the thing with my grandmother that was most amazing is that my grandmother was a pancake artist. She didn't call them pancakes, she called them cakes on the griddle. She had this really big griddle on the stove and she had multiple bowls full of different colored batter. She made the batter different colors with food coloring. That's before we knew it caused cancer. And all this food coloring, we had red, a bowl of red batter and yellow batter and green batter, etc., etc. And she had different sized ladles. And we children, we grandchildren, wake up every morning this particular summer to the delightful aroma. No alarm clock, just that smell we would begin, to, I would just be sound asleep and I would begin to smell pancakes. Think, oh, get up, Ty, get up, get up. And we children would race into the kitchen and line up and we could order anything we wanted. I want a dolphin, I want a giraffe, I want a hippo, I want a platypus, whatever, I want a tiger, I want a lion. And she, with her different colored batters and her different size ladles, she would make that shape on the griddle. She was a pancake artist. She should have been paid for this, she wasn't. And just make these animals and serve them to the children. Well, this particular morning, I was in the kitchen while she's making the pancakes and I was about to cry because we were playing hide and seek, all of us children, my two younger brothers, my younger sister, and just a bunch of cousins, I don't know how many, just, just there were cousins, Every, this place was just full of little kids. And we were playing hide and seek and every good hiding place was taken. That's a trauma when you're eight years old. And I'm just standing there in the kitchen, my bottom lip is quivering, I'm about to cry, and my older cousin is counting up to, I don't know, 100 or something, 90, 91, 95, 96, and I'm just about to cry. And she's just standing there cooking. And she says, very casually, like this wasn't an emergency, she said, Ty, I said, yes, Grandma. She said, do you want the best hiding place on earth? I said, yes, Grandma, yes. I'm going to get caught. There's no hiding places. They're all taken. She said, Ty, my cousin's 96, 97. I'm about to, about to get caught. Come on, Grandma, hurry up. Where's this place? 97, she said, Ty. She's just all casual about it, just cooking. She says, Ty, I will give you the best hiding place on earth, but I'm telling you, I'm commanding you, Whatever you do, when you get there, do not look up. <laughs> I said, I promise, Grandma, I will not look up. Where is the hiding place? 98, I'm about to get caught. And my grandma lifts her dress 
and gives one motion with the spatula, and I, it don't, okay, I get it. So I slide to home base right there. She drops her dress around me, and then she just stands there cooking. All the other children were found, but not me. And as I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm doing, I'm all I can do to maintain self-control, not to giggle, because I don't want, I'm just, oh, this is so good. There is nobody who has this hiding place. This is me and me alone. There was, I was so happy, and they found every kid, and then they're all saying, where's Ty, where's Ty, where's Ty? We can't find him, we looked everywhere. And my grandma, she's just standing there cooking. She says, maybe he's outside. So I hear all the children, yeah, 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 he's outside. <laughs> They all go out the front door, the back door, the slamming, and then the silence. Okay, they're all, they're gone, right? My grandma lifts her dress, and I emerge, and she says, see, told you, best hiding place on earth. <laughs> and then she leaned real close, and she said, Ty, I love you, and everything's going to be okay. Because the part of the story I didn't tell you is that the reason I was at my grandmother's house is because while we were playing hide-and-seek and eating pancakes, my 27-year-old mother was lying on one of my grandmother's beds with fractured ribs, a fractured skull, multiple face wounds because she had received her last beating in an abusive marriage, and we had driven all night my mom and us four children out of Los Angeles over to Phoenix, Arizona to take refuge in my grandmother's house. So we weren't just there playing. Grandmother wasn't just a wonderful grandma in the sense that she could cook. Grandma was a place of healing and restoration and a constant reminder that everything was going to be okay. So, as you might imagine, to this day, I cannot smell pancakes without the memory trigger being pulled and remembering my grandmother and that experience. Because everything that we experience as human beings occurs against the backdrop of sensory stimuli. You may smell something that reminds you of One of your experiences, you may hear a song that reminds you of a person. Jesus was particularly specifically blessed by an individual who gave him a gift in order to remind him over and over again of the fact that he was loved during the darkest and most painful part of his experience. The story is in Matthew chapter 26. So track with me as Matthew tells us this story, and then we'll loop back and we'll understand the connection. Now it came to pass, verse 1, that when Jesus had finished all these sayings he had been teaching, that he said to his disciples, so picture it, He's with his disciples, and they are walking along on some journey, going somewhere, and Jesus just finished teaching, and he says to his disciples something. He says, you know that after two days, now, just in the text of Scripture, take hold of two days, put that in your pocket, and hold on to it for a minute, because we're going to come back to two days. You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be what? crucified. So in the story, Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus, from the point at which he's having this conversation, is going to be crucified in how long? Just two days, that's all. Now watch this. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people were assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. So Matthew, who's the storyteller on this occasion, wants us to see two tiers or two loops to this story. There's Jesus with his disciples, and they're walking along on some foot journey, going somewhere, and Jesus says, in two days I'm going to be crucified. Then Matthew says, but hey, come over here to another part of the story, because while Jesus is with his disciples and they're on that journey, there is a gathering taking place somewhere across town 
with religious leaders who are in the process of plotting to take the life of Jesus. And they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But notice what they said, the religious leaders. But not during the feast or the religious festival, lest there be an uproar among the people. This is absolutely astounding. These religious leaders are plotting the murder of the Son of God, but they don't want it to get in the way of their religion. Ellen White very insightfully informs us that in fact the most dangerous element in the world is religion. Religion, in fact, is the best place in the world to hide from God. In the book Desire of Ages, page 309, please take a look at it sometime, Ellen White explains how that, quote, unquote, the greatest deception of the human mind in the time of Christ was the idea that a theological knowledge of the truth constitutes righteousness. And the people who had that theological knowledge of the truth were simultaneously using their influence to align themselves against Christ and to crucify him. And when Jesus was in Bethany, now pause right there. So in the first part of the story, Matthew says, hey, Jesus is with his disciples and they're walking along, they're headed somewhere. Now we know where they were headed because Jesus and his disciples, they arrive at their destination. Where were they going all along? To Bethany. Now, you have to understand something about Bethany. Bethany is a familiar place for Jesus. He's been there a number of times because in Bethany, there is a brother and two sisters with whom Jesus has a very close friendship. He often goes to the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and there he, like I did at my grandmother's house, he takes refuge from the press of the crowd and the, the constant movements that are working toward his demise. Jesus will find himself in the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and they'll be eating food because Martha's a great cook, and Mary is somewhat of a scholar who's at the feet of Jesus asking theological questions, and Lazarus is just a very dear friend of Jesus. So Bethany is a familiar place for Christ, but on this particular occasion, at the end of his ministry, what you need to understand, what I need to understand, is that this time Jesus is not in Bethany for the regular reason he goes there. On this occasion, it says, when Jesus was in Bethany at the, at the house of who? Simon the leper. Who's this guy in the story? Well, Simon the leper, Simon is a Pharisee. He's a religious leader. He's a high-profile religious leader in the community. And he had leprosy. And Jesus healed his leprosy. So what is Simon doing and why is Jesus coming to his house? Well, if you had leprosy, let's just think this through for a minute. If you had leprosy and you were healed of leprosy, what would you do? You might do something like Simon is doing. Simon is throwing a party or what the Bible calls a feast in honor of Jesus. Jesus healed him, so he's throwing a party in the honor of Christ. And he's also throwing a party, if you take in the commentary of the book Desire of Ages by Ellen White, he's also throwing a party because Lazarus was recently dead and Jesus resurrected him. Now, if you have leprosy and you get healed, you should have a party. If you're dead and you're resurrected, you should definitely have a party. So here, Simon is throwing a party, a feast, a celebration, and Jesus is the one who is the center of attention. He's the one that's being celebrated. They are grateful for what he's done, and the party's happening at Simon's house. Now, this is fascinating, because what happens in a party, not that you've ever been to one because you're a Seventh-day Adventist, but you've been to a good party, right? A holy party. This is a holy party. This is a good party. You, have you ever been in a room with 20, 30, 40 people all together, happy, celebrating something? What's going on in that room? Try to feel the room. Is there food at a party? Yes or no? 
Yes, lots of good food, hopefully, or it's not worth going to. Okay, is there music at a good party? Yes, there's good music at a good party. Is there conversation? Are people talking? Hey, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time, right? Hey, down there, pass the hummus and the pita bread this way. There's a lot of voices, right? There's chatter, there's laughter, there's music, there's, let's just call it noise, okay? There's noise at a party. Now, Jesus is at this party with Simon. It's full of people, and then we have these words in the next verse. A woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Okay, you have an imagination. What just happened in that room? It's quiet. Thank you. Somebody, somebody, yeah, there's chatter, there's talk, there's, there's laughter, there's music, and suddenly this woman, this woman makes her way into the room, and she has a mission, and nobody is, expects this. This is not anticipated. She comes into the room, and does she stop to say hello to anyone? Is she having conversations along the way? Is she grabbing up a little baba ganoush and some pita bread on her way? No. What does she do? She walks in the room and where does she go? Immediately. She goes straight where? To Jesus. And she has this flask and it's full of, what is the grammar? What does the text say? What kind of oil is this? It is characterized by two features. It's costly and it's fragrant. And she opens it and the fragrance begins to fill the room. And then she pours this fragrance, according to the text, where? Where, everybody? On his head. Now, now gravity has its way with the oil, and it's on his head, and it's going down through his hair, and it's into his beard and trickling down onto his clothing. Well, later on in the passage, it says not only did she pour it on his head, she also doused his body with it. And Luke's gospel says that after she poured it on his head and put it on his body, she got down on her hands and knees and she poured the oil on his feet and took up the excess with her hair. So what the Bible wants you and I to see is that this woman has covered Jesus with this oil head to foot. Do you have the picture so far? Now, why is this significant? As the woman pours this oil on Jesus, what happens? But when the disciples, when his disciples saw this happening, what was their immediate impulse? They were indignant, saying, why this what? What? To them, they perceive what she's doing as wasteful. This is a waste of money. Do you realize this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, again, if you take Desire of Ages into account, she says that the person who was instigating this thought was none other than the treasurer of the church. It was Judas who was saying, hey, uh, this is wasteful, and the disciples kind of picked up on it. Yeah, 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 it's wasteful. It's wasteful. This money should have been given to the poor. Well. Judas wasn't concerned about the poor. He was concerned about the money not being wasted on Jesus so he could take his skim off the top and then give some to the poor. There was embezzlement going on in the backdrop here. But when Jesus was aware of it, what's it? He was aware that the disciples were chattering about this with negativity. He said to them, why do you trouble the woman, for she has done a good work for me. Notice in the text what they called waste, Jesus called good work. Hold on to that. Now, Jesus explains to them what the woman is doing, and this is the amazing part that you need to grasp. For you will have the poor with you always, but me you will not have always always. What does Jesus know and what did he tell them back in verse 1? After two days, I'm going to be crucified. Okay, I'm not going to be with you always. This woman gets something you disciples don't get. You're going to have the poor with you always, but I'm not going to be here with you always. Now, this is the punchline in the story. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. 
Okay, now you have to pan out with me and understand something that's going on here. First of all, back in verse 1, when Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be crucified in two days, do they say anything about that? Nothing. They're silent. In fact, if you read the Gospels, they have been pushing back on this idea over and over again. No, you're not going to be crucified. Quit talking like that. That's not going to happen. The disciples wanted a certain kind of Messiah. They wanted a military Messiah. They wanted a political Messiah that would overthrow the Romans and exalt Israel to the pinnacle of political and military power. But here's the secret of the gospel that we discovered last night. God only operates by the power of non-coercive love. God isn't in the business of forcing his way into anybody's heart or life. He's in the business of revealing his love with such crystal clarity that people voluntarily return to him and give themselves to him. Because of that, Jesus cannot set up a military political kingdom because he didn't come into the world to force people to bow before him and his kingdom. He came into the world to conquer sin at a deeper level in the human heart. And so what the disciples are expecting doesn't match up with a crucified Messiah. So they're silent, but I want you to notice something. Jesus says that this woman poured this fragrant oil on him because she was anointing him for what? So there's one person in the story who actually knows and believes that Jesus will be crucified. It's not Peter. It's not James. It's not John. It's definitely not Thomas. None of these guys believe that Jesus has to die or that he will die but this woman alone understands so much so that she's gone out on a mission she has purchased fragrant oil for what purpose well in that culture they didn't do embalming of the deceased they did something different the loved ones gathered together fragrant oils and herbs that would be put on and around the dead body to mask the odor of decay in honor of the dead. This woman is deliberately engaging in an act of treating Jesus with the anointing that is appropriate post-mortem, after death, but she's doing it before he dies. Now here's the thing we need to understand about the genius of this act. Ellen White says it this way, the fragrant gift which Mary had thought to lavish upon the what, everybody? The dead body of the Savior she poured upon his living form. Okay, so according to this, what was her original plan? When she went out and she bought the oil, what was the original plan? Postmortem. I'm going to follow the natural customs of the time. He's going to die. I know he's going to die. Peter doesn't know. James doesn't know. John doesn't know. I believe he's going to die. And when he does, I'm going to be there with my fragrant oil to put it on his body after he dies. But then she gets an ingenious idea. She says, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I anoint his body with this oil after he dies, he won't know that I love him. So I'm going to put the oil on him strategically planned right before he's going to be crucified. What did he say in verse 1? And I told you to put it in your pocket. He's going to be crucified in how long? Just two days. So Jesus, Jesus has this oil put on him, and Ellen White says that the woman had originally planned to put it on his dead body. But watch this. She goes on. Ellen White says, at the burial, its sweetness, the sweetness of this fragrance, could only have pervaded what? The tomb. But now it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. 
So what was this woman doing? What was Mary doing? She was communicating to Jesus in this gift. She was communicating. She was saying, I know you're going to die, and I want you to know that whatever you're about to go through, whatever you're about to endure, I want you to know that I love you. That was the message in the fragrant gift. Ellen White goes on. Mary pouring out her love upon the Savior while he was what? Conscious of her devotion was anointing him for the burial. Do you see what she's doing? This is amazing. As he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed an earnest or like a down payment of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones forever. This is amazing. Jesus was at Simon's feast. Mary put this oil upon his body head to foot. Jesus from Simon's feast gets up and leaves and goes to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And as he's sitting at the table eating the Passover with his disciples, the first act in the final scenes of the drama unfolds when Judas gets up to leave the Passover to go betray him for silver. Jesus feels the pain of that betrayal, but then he breathes. And the fragrance reminds him that even though Judas is betraying me, Mary gets it and loves me. Wow. Assuredly, I say to you that wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This is the only experience in Jesus' life that he explicitly says, wherever you preach the gospel, you've got to tell this story. You have to tell her story. Why? I'll tell you why. Because Mary is a prophetic prototype of God's end-time people. The experience that Mary has with Jesus is the experience that Jesus wants you and me to have with him. What was that experience? Well, it goes back to her first encounter with the Savior. When the religious leaders, the same ones that were plotting his crucifixion, yanked this woman, actually the Desire of Ages says that they set her up. It was all planned. They set her up with a man and then pretended to catch her in the act of adultery. They yank her out of an adulterous bed. They drag her through the city. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. And they quote scripture to him for her condemnation. Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus says nothing. He stoops down and he begins to write on the ground in the dust of the temple floor. He begins to write, and we do not, we're not told what he was writing, but we have a pretty good clue of what he was writing, because then the scripture says that as he wrote, and he said, any one of you without sin cast the first stone at her, and then he writes. And then the scripture says that all of those Pharisees and religious leaders began to leave beginning with the oldest down to the youngest. He even knew their ages, and he just picked them off one at a time. And he wrote, no doubt, their secret sins, which brought them to an equal position in need of a Savior with her. And they couldn't process it, so each one left. Until the scripture says that Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. Now he's alone with the woman. And he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is remarkable. Jesus is doing something in this woman's heart that is the essence of the gospel. And this is why Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, this woman's experience has to be told over and over and over again. This is the story of Scripture that should be on repeat mode in all of our evangelistic endeavors. Why? Because this woman was experiencing 
what Jesus here articulates to the woman, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. Do you see the relationship between these two factors? Jesus is essentially saying to this woman, in the light, in the realization of my love for you, you don't have to live that way anymore. Sin no longer has dominion over you. Not because you are in yourself of sufficient willpower or strength to overcome sin. You're not. But in the light of my love for you, you are. And Jesus says, tell her story everywhere you go. Ellen White articulates it like this. She says, nothing reaches so fully down to the deepest motives of conduct as a sense of the pardoning love of Christ. There is nothing in the whole world, indeed nothing in the whole universe, as powerful as a deep sense that God loves me and forgives me. The moment I enter that psychological framework, the moment I feel those feelings and think those thoughts, Ellen White says something remarkable happens. My conduct and my motives begin to change. Or Jesus said it this way, speaking straight to Simon, who began to complain about this woman. I tell you, Simon, that her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows little love. Here's, you guys think this through, here's the litmus test. Here's, here's the measure of what's going on in my experience or your experience. The person who is forgiven much, that is, they know they are forgiven much, has much love for the Savior. But the person who does not realize how deeply they've been forgiven shows little love and is just going through the motions of judgmental, condemnatory, censoring religion, policing the church of God rather than drawing people in to the influence of his love. This is what I call the power equation of the gospel. And the words are in quote marks because they're from the book Desire of Ages. Here's the power equation of the gospel. Love begets love. The love of God produces love in the human heart that returns to God. Or, to wrap scripture around it, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. His love is first and primary. I don't have love in myself to work up or to manufacture. I don't have anything in myself to render to him in the steam and power of my own will. I need one thing. You need one thing. Vital contact with the love of God in Christ. If his love permeates our thinking, it will produce a returning current of love to him. Jesus carried with him, Ellen White said, that fragrance through the darkest hours of his life. After she covered his body with this fragrance, Jesus celebrated the Passover. Judas went on his mission of betrayal. Jesus rose from the Passover and he went with his disciples, minus Judas, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told the disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. And to use the words of Ellen White, he staggered as under the weight of a great burden away from them in the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane and he fell to the ground. He did not formally get on his knees and pray. He fell to the ground and began to heave and to cry. The book of Hebrews says that he was weeping. He was crying. And as Jesus was weeping and crying on the cold ground 
of that garden, Ellen White says that spontaneously his fingers began to clutch the cold ground, the gravel, the rocks, the dirt, as if to prevent himself from being pulled farther away from the Father. Jesus begins to feel the separation that sin makes between God and man, and he prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, Father. And as Jesus is there on that cold ground, feeling the trauma of the shame and guilt of the sin of the world upon his conscience, with every inhalation of air, the fragrance that is all over his body fills him with the memory that even in these darkest hours, Mary understands she gets it. She loves me. This mission is for her and for everybody else who, through this sacrifice, will return to God. Finally, the mob comes and he is betrayed with a kiss and then he breathes and the fragrance fills his nostrils and he remembers Mary. And then he is beaten and with every fist that strikes him, he breathes, and Mary's mission is accomplished. She's pulling the memory trigger over and over again. I'm with you, Jesus. I'm with you. I'm not with you in person, but I'm with you in love with this fragrant gift. She's reminding him, and then they take him to the cross, and they drive the nails through his hands and feet. They lift the cross. They drop it in the hole that is prepared for it, and every tendon of his body wrenches downward with excruciating agony, and he breathes and remembers Mary. He's covered with this fragrant oil, and she is reminding him every step of the way of her love and that his sacrifice, his sacrifice is not in vain. Finally, Jesus breathes his last breath and it is with that fragrance. They lay him in the tomb, and on the third day, he takes his first breath of air again, and she's there again in that fragrant oil reminding him, even on resurrection morning, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me first. The stone is rolled away, and Jesus, still covered with that oil, emerges from the tomb, and Peter's not there, and John's not there, and James isn't there. None of the disciples are there because none of them understood or believed that he would even be crucified, and they are completely disoriented. But when Jesus emerges from the tomb, let me ask you, who is there? Mary is there. She throws her arms around him, and the gospel says that he tells her as she's holding him, detain me not, Jesus says, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. And then he tells Mary, go tell my disciples and Peter. Emphasis on Peter. Go tell my disciples and Peter that I am risen. Tell them what you have seen here, and then Jesus, as Mary runs off to be the first preacher of the gospel, Jesus ascends to the throne room of the universe, and the whole throne room is filled with that fragrant aroma. And Desire of Ages says that all the angels got on their faces and began to worship him upon his return to heaven. And do you know what he did, according to Ellen White? Jesus refused their worship and told the angels to get up off of their knees and to stop worshiping him. Do you know why? Because he had one question. He turns to the Father as the angels cease their worship, and he says, Father, can those whom you have given me be with me here where I am? Father, was the sacrifice acceptable? Are they saved? Can they be healed? Can they come here? And the Father says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
beautiful, well done, son. Yes, 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 they can be here. And then all the angels bow to worship him a second time. No doubt wondering, is he going to tell us to get up again? But he doesn't. The second time he receives their worship. Why? Because he now has the assurance of your salvation and mine. The only thing that matters to him. And these are the final words I'll leave you with. Ellen White says, that in that moment, standing in the throne room, pervaded with the fragrant aroma of Mary's gift, as the angels are worshiping him, she says, he did not count even heaven itself a place to be desired while we were lost. Wow. So I don't know about you, but every time I smell the aroma of pancakes, I think of my grandmother and the healing and refuge that we found at her house that summer. Every time Jesus smells anything beautiful, he remembers Mary and he remembers you and me. And from this day forward, maybe every time you smell anything delightful or see anything beautiful or hear birds singing, maybe everything beautiful to our senses in the world should remind us of God's great love for us. Father in heaven, thank you for the great sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example that Mary has given us. that example of ardent, devoted, committed love. Father, may her experience be ours. May we be free from all formalistic, obligatory, duty-bound, cultural, intellectual. Father, may we be free from mere religion and delivered, be delivered into your arms, Lord. May we love you because you have first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.